Hello, I'm Bill Kennedy, teacher with Carl Voigt of Koinonia class, and I want to welcome you to lesson seven of our series of 13 lessons on the parables of Jesus as found in the Gospel of Luke. The title of today's lesson is Why Do Good People Suffer? The selected passage of scripture is Luke 13, one through nine. You probably should go ahead and turn in your Bible to that passage now as I give you a brief introduction in just a few minutes. But first, I'd like for us to pray together. Father, we acknowledge that the title of this lesson poses a difficult question for us because we struggle to understand suffering, tragedy, and death. We also frequently struggle to know how to turn to you at such times because our sins of independence and desperation make you seem distant. So we ask you to open our hearts and minds in this study, draw us closer to you. May we hear your message over and above our thoughts and the words that I'm about to share. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I have with me, and perhaps you saw the comic strip, Pearls Before Swines, that appeared in the Johnson City Press just 10 days ago. And um, I thought it was appropriate for this lesson. It appeared on Wednesday, January 12th. Rat is listening to a conversation between goat and pig. So goat says, hey pig, I'm sort of afraid to ask because you haven't talked about her in quite a while, but is everything okay with your grandma? Oh, thank you goat. But yeah, she's in a better place now. Oh my goodness, Goat says. I'm sorry, Pig, I'm so sorry. The next frame, Pig turns to Rat. What an odd reaction to Grandma buying a condo. Well, as a physician, I've heard questions similar to the title of our lesson, Why Do Good People Suffer? throughout my long career. I'm retired from treating patients now, but I still hear that sort of question. In my current professional work as an orthopedic surgeon, helping injured people bring insurance claims and lawsuits to closure. The first thing that jumped out at me about the lesson title was the word good. Let me ask you, are there any good people? Paul admonishes us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So maybe we should change the title of the lesson to why do redeemed people suffer, or why do Christians suffer chronic debilitating diseases, or permanent injuries, or get killed in accidents, or die prematurely in unexpectedly. Well, what do you hear people say when bad things happen to good redeemed people? Well, here are some of the things that I hear. I hear sometimes that there's a quiet assumption that the person has done something wrong and we don't know about it, or the person is not right with God. Well, usually that assumption is not spoken or maybe it's whispered very quietly and in confidence. God is making you strong. This tragedy will make you a better person is another thing that I hear sometime. The doctors will learn more about this terrible disease through taking care of you. God never puts more on you than you can handle. Well, by that theory, the weaker you are, the better. He's going to a better place. Just as Pig said to Goat. By this theory, we should wish that all of our loved ones will die right away. It must have been God's will. Well, does God will evil or tragedy? I would urge you to be especially careful about assuming that an illness or tragedy or death is God's will. I hear it often. 
When experiencing grief from the death of a loved one, we commonly go through months of at least five complex stages that include anger and depression. To assume that evil or tragedy is God's will can be a perfect setup for being angry with God. Being angry with God can compound any feelings you might have of guilt or depression, which can send you down a one-way street of gloom and doom, driving you away from God instead of into his loving arms where you belong. So I'd be very cautious about blaming God for tragedy or for a premature death or an accident. But there is mystery in tragedy. We need to admit that. Mystery in the sense that we don't fully understand it, but we naturally try to understand it. That's why we often come up with explanations and theories that really on close examination don't make sense. We need to recognize that we probably can never explain tragedy satisfactorily. I think it's important to be honest and admit it when we don't have answers. Many times I have told patients that I really don't understand based on the information that I have and the tests that we've done why you're having the pain that you have. So to be honest about that, that's important for me as a physician and spiritually it's important for me as a Christian. Speculation seldom leads to clarification and it often causes confusion and trouble. So we need to be careful about that. Now, let me share with you also, since I'm a physician, that Medical science approaches suffering by asking a question that's very different from why, as given in the title of this lesson. In medicine, we ask what, not why. What, for example, is a series of steps that the SARS-CoV-2 virus goes through in our bodies to result in the disease COVID-19? What can we do to prevent the virus from entering our bodies? What can we do to treat the disease? What are the responses of the human body to a broken bone? Those are the types of questions that we ask in medicine. What can we do to promote healing and rehabilitation from a broken bone? What is the effectiveness of the prevention or treatment that's being recommended? But well, the question of what is happening is often expressed as why. Why is Mildred sick? Instead of what kind of a disease does she have or does she have an infectious disease? What's going on in her body? What can we do is often expressed with the word of how. How can we help the bone to heal in good position and restore function? Still, the important question behind those two questions of why and how is really the question of what. When we try to help others who are suffering and when we ourselves are suffering, we should try to avoid raising questions that call for speculation and have no answers. Well, what can we do in the face of suffering and tragedy. Scientists often defer to religion to answer the question of why. But I would submit to you that the Bible does not give us very many clear answers to the question of why. In fact, the Bible often asks and responds to the question of what. So it may be then rather the question of why even our Christian religion, even the Bible, asks primarily what. That's an important distinction because there's seldom an answer to the question of why, but frequently we can find answers to questions of what and then can know what to do and what we can do with ourselves to help other people uh, and how to approach the problem that we're experiencing. Well, the Bible can give us 
valuable insights to help us prepare for and go through suffering and tragedy. Let's begin our close look at Luke 13, one through nine, the selected passage for today, by seeing where Luke placed it in his gospel. In Luke nine, going all the way back to nine, Jesus has turned resolutely toward Jerusalem. And you know what that means. That means the cross, the trial, the cross. In Luke 12, Jesus gives us a series of warnings and encouragements ending with a challenge to interpret our own time and evaluate our own lives. So that's an insight that Jesus gives us to help prepare us for suffering and tragedy. So the first point in this lesson that I wanna share with you is that we need to interpret our own time and evaluate our own lives. So I hope you've got your Bibles open to Luke 13. If you do, it won't be any trouble at all for you to look with me at Luke 12, begin with verse 54, the last two paragraphs in this NIV that I'm reading from. He, Jesus said to the crowd, when you see a cloud rising in the West, immediately you say it's going to rain and it does. And when the South wind blows, you say, it's going to be hot. And it is. Hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret the present time? Why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? As you're going with your adversary to the magistrate, try hard to be reconciled on the way or your adversary may drag you off to the judge and the judge may turn you over to the officer and the officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you will not get out until you've paid the last penny. If people in the crowd, including Jesus critics, onlookers and Jesus followers, know how to interpret popular weather signs, why don't they know how to interpret the time in which they were living? and judge for themselves what is right and what is wrong. Calling them hypocrites implies that they do know or could know, but they choose not to open their eyes about the condition of the world or make the right choices in their own lives. In those verses, Jesus gives us a challenge to wake up, be aware of the world around us, and evaluate our own lives before it's too late. He is giving us the opportunity to search more deeply into our lives and draw closer to him. That's what many of us do anyway when we're facing tragedy. But he is urging us to do it now before tragedy strikes. Well, the second point that I get out of this lesson is that we need to understand that our guilt does not mysteriously cause tragedy without an obvious cause or an effect relationship, such as if you shoot someone, because that's obvious, or if you jump from a high place and get injured, that's pretty obvious cause and effect, or if you abuse your body in some tragic way. So let's look at Luke 13, one through five, and get into the selected passage for today's lesson. Now, there was some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all of the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will perish. Are those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all of the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Well, we have no information about either of these tragedies. Pilate, the Roman pure procurator in uh, Judea did a lot of wicked and cruel things. We do know that much. 
the Jewish historian Josephus tells us about some of that. The brief description of mixing the Galileans' blood with their sacrifice sounds like he may have deliberately had them killed while they were in the temple. The victims died in that case because, because of an evil act that was beyond the victim's control. Well, the 18 killed when the Tower of Siloam collapsed sounds more like an accident. Some disasters do occur naturally or unexpectedly, and we struggle to understand the series of events that led to the disaster. But in both cases, Jesus made clear that neither of the tragedies occurred as punishment for the sins of the victims. The victims were no more worse sinners and no more guilty than other people. Now, Jesus says the same thing in another situation over in John 9, 1 through 5. If you'll turn with me quickly to John 9, 1 through 5, we'll come back to Luke 13 in a moment. In John 9, beginning with verse 1, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work while I am in the world. I am the light of the world. So back to Luke 13, 1 through 5. Jesus makes no distinction between deliberate murder and accidental death. Jesus also does not comment on the question of why, does he? Why those tragedies occurred? We may ask that question, but Jesus doesn't comment on that. That can be frustrating to us. But instead, see what Jesus did. He rises above the question of why, and he takes the opportunity to tell us that unless we repent, we too will all perish. That's the third insight that Jesus gives us in this lesson to help us prepare for suffering and tragedy. That's a surprise, isn't it? So let's look and see what Jesus tells us about why we should print, uh, should repent, or else we too shall perish. Let's start with another passage outside of Luke, a familiar one to us. In the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5:45, Jesus tells us, in the context of having love for our enemies, that your father in heaven causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Well, the SARS-CoV-2 virus doesn't know whether we're righteous or unrighteous or anything else about us. We're all vulnerable for diseases and injury because we're physical beings living in a physical world. Suffering is an inevitable part of living in this physical world. If whether redeemed or not, we're all in the same boat. And if our guilt does not lead to punishment in the form of tragedy, then you may ask, why do we need to repent to prepare for suffering and tragedy? Well, in a sermon on Luke 13, 1 through 5, in September 2017, Dr. Hood told us that repentance is necessary. It means to turn away, to be done with our sins, to change directions. In this context, I took it to mean turn away from the arrogance that separates us from God while we're trying to understand and get through suffering and tragedy, to turn away from our own resources, thoughts, and ideas and turn to God. Well, Dr. Hood went on to tell us that faith in Christ is 
the hopeful corollary, the other side of the coin of repentance. True repentance leads to salvation. 2 Corinthians 7.10 Without repentance, we will not have the gift of salvation that can give us hope as we experience grief and go through suffering and death. Furthermore, repentance is not a single action. Often we tend to think of it that way, but it's a lifestyle. We know that we can never live completely as God wants us to live. Our confession and repentance can do much to help us draw closer to God and maintain an awareness of his presence and power in our lives. Well, let's go on to the parable for today, which is an extended parable, Luke 13, 6 through 8, and see how the parable contributes to what we've already been going through. But then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, the gardener, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. I'll cultivate it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Well, the landowner keeps careful records of the productivity of his vineyard. He knows which trees are producing and which are not. A fig tree normally produces about three crops of figs per year, and it requires very little care, at least in the, in the Middle East. After about three years of fruitlessness, the owner of the land orders the gardener to cut the barren tree down and replace it with the young tree being cultivated in another spot. But the gardener suggests that the tree should be given one more year, during which time he will cultivate and fertilize the tree. If it doesn't bear fruit at the end of that year, its time will be up and it'll be cut down. Well, we're not told the outcome for the tree, are we? But the point is that just as any orchard or vineyard owner will have a limit as to how long unfruitful trees are allowed to live, so our lives are limited by our physical nature. Jesus did not come to answer all of our questions. He came to seek and to save the lost including, of course, us. He came to call us into a right relationship with God through faith and to make that relationship fruitful in his kingdom, the kingdom of God. The proper care and nurturing of our relationship with God through Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives will get us through suffering and tragedy in the best way possible regardless of what's happening to us or what's going on around us. In his mercy, when we go through trials of suffering and grieving of any kind, the Lord offers us his love with open arms. He assures us that he is with us and he will be with us to the end. We need to treasure that in our hearts. While there is still time, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Isaiah 55, 6. And incidentally, when I was searching for that passage, I found the same two lines of poetry many other times in the scripture. Here's another one. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. 
In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. When desperate for strength and comfort in the face of tragedy, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Matthew 7, 7. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 35 and 37 through 39. In closing, please join me in another prayer. Lord, when we are faced with suffering and tragedy, help us never to forget the power of your presence to give us strength and peace. As we experience your many blessings to us under such circumstances, teach us how to reach out in ministry to others who suffer. We pray this in the strong name of your son, Jesus Christ, who came among us, who suffered and died for us, and whom you raised to glory that he might remain with us now and forever. Amen. In Quantania class, within a few days of most Sunday morning gatherings, we send out our notes from the lesson of the day. If you would like to have my notes from today's lesson, send me an email, and I'm showing you the email here on the screen, wkennedymd at gmail.com, or call me on my cell phone as best, 423-416-4201. You should also be able to reach me, of course, if you lose this contact way of reaching me. You should be able to reach me through the church office we will also send you a table of parables of Jesus in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, arranged by their literary type that we found to be very helpful in our study in the Quantineer class of Jesus' parables in Luke. In addition, my wife, Virginia, has compiled a number of books on various aspects of suffering and grief arranged at the end of my notes in no particular order that we will also share with you with the notes. I hope that this lesson has been helpful to you as it has been very helpful to me as I have studied and as I have prepared to share it with you. Thank you very much for joining me in this recording. Um, I hope that uh, you will be able to gain some benefit from having spent this time with me and hopefully in prayer with the Lord during the time that we have had together. Thank you very much. <music>